Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. My name is Barb Emery. For those of you who don't know me, I assured Pastor Dave that we can still do church while he takes a much needed vacation. Is that allowed? Yes, it's allowed. All of us have been doing vacation most of the summer, and it is his turn. And he and his family, along with Heather's parents and his parents, are up at Camp of the Woods, about five and a half hours away, getting some intensive teaching from some great people there and enjoying family time. And it just is past due for him and his family. So pray for them this week and um, just pray that they would be rested and rejuvenated. The Lord would minister to them and Pastor Dave would come back just overjoyed with um, the Holy Spirit's presence and his refreshing. It's good to see you this morning. If you're a visitor, we welcome you to the Finley Lake Church this morning. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 50 to 58. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has not been swallowed up by, in victory. Where, O oh, death, is victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We have a great privilege and honor this morning to be able to welcome a brother in the Lord. <laughs> Jeff and I go way back. Come on up, Jeff. Jeff Rotunda, for those of you who don't know him, this is his home church. I prayed with him this morning, and he says, God, it's good to be in my home church, Lord. He has his beautiful wife, April, with him this morning, his oldest son, Gary, and Jeremiah is here, too, back in junior church. Jeff and I were lay, lay leaders together. Oh, my gosh, I don't know, 12 or 14 years ago here. And I said, Jeff, doesn't this bring up memories? He said, yeah, it does. Jeff uh, has built his second home building his second home <laughs> from scratch. He's doing a great job. April is well involved in that. You've done a, she's done a great job interior, and it's uh, as hard as it is to build homes. You're also serving the Lord, working in ministry. Jeff is uh, executive director two years now at the You Can Men's Ministry in Jamestown. That is a ministry for homeless men. And you've been executive director for two years. Been involved in that ministry for four. And uh, just praying for God to open up a shelter for women and children and families as well. He's had some enemy attacks this week as he's trying to follow the Lord and his will for that to happen in Jamestown. But you have a vision that that would be able to happen in four corners of Chautauqua County, north, south, east, and west. And I'll tell you, he's passionate for the hurting and the broken, loves the Lord, 
and really has a great message for us today. I know Pastor Dave called you, invited you, and he's got a title of Seize the Day, which has been our series, Work to be Done. And there's no better person to speak on this than Jeff. And I know God has been preparing him and laid a message on his heart, but I'd like to pray for you and your family, April and Gary, and and, uh, all you men, if you can just... Raise your hands, all of us up here to Jeff, and let's pray over him and see what God is going to do. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I praise you and thank you for our brother Jeff and the way you have been working in him and through him. Lord, all of the years that uh, I have known him, he has loved you with an unending love, been very passionate about serving you and doing your will. You have stretched him and taken him to many different places with lots of experiences, Lord. And now this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit's anointing would be on him, Lord, that you would speak through him to each one of us, that our hearts and minds would be open to what you have for us through Jeff. We're very excited, and we thank you so much for the word that we're about to receive. Be with April and Gary and Jeremiah as as a family. They love you, they praise you, and they serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Jeff. He's trying to get used to his cordless or his... his Oh, no, I just got to make sure I turn it on. Yes. (laughs) Welcome, Jeff. Oh. No. It's, uh, no, that, that praise and, and honor and that those applause go to God and God himself and uh, through the salvation of Jesus Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit that I stand before you and no other reason why. Um, I, I was just thinking uh, and, and coming in uh, just to address the, the, for those who know me, I'm sure most of you are like, man, he has a lot of gray hair. So yes, I'm still in my early 40s, not 50s, as I may look, um, but the Bible says it's what, a crown of glory, right? And uh, some of you who follow me on Facebook or, or follow the, the mission, uh, uh, you know that my hair was purple for about a month and a half, and I didn't think it was ever going to come out because of uh, it was uh, being obedient and, and showing not only my sons that I'm a man of my word, but uh, also other organizations as there was some friendly uh, competition happening within the, the city of Jamestown and other organizations. Options Care Center, which is an uh, uh, organization that helps expectant mothers who are considering abortion to um, consider the other option of life and truth and and what jesus can do and so uh the just to throw that out there the competition was to um during a a fundraising uh day whoever had the most uh donations within that time frame or donors not money but donors uh, the loser had to color their hair either purple for options care center or blue for ucan city mission and of course i don't want to admit it but yes i did lose uh drastically um but it was worthwhile so um thank you so much for allowing me to be here i'll try not to drive anna too crazy with me moving around Uh, i just can't stand still and uh i know we try to as we have moved forward with COVID, that things do change and hey i know the live stream is going so welcome everybody who is watching us on facebook and uh, I am truly grateful. So before I go any further, let me open with some prayer here, and we'll go from there. So Father God, thank you so much for this day, for the opportunities that you have given us, that the end journey is set before us, as we already have heard what the mystery is. But that's not the end of where we are called to stop but to continue on and help us to discover that today, Father, whether through me or in spite of me this day. May your words, may your truth, may your glory be given today. And we thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So as, as Barb has, had, had mentioned, yeah, I'm the executive director of the UCAN City Mission, the, the only home, male homeless shelter in Chautauqua County. And uh, if anybody has read the Post Journal uh, this week, uh, if you've read uh, Executive Director Jeff Rotunda, 
said this, this, and this. Yes, that is I. So, and it is all true. Um, <laughs> but I would not be an executive director if it wasn't for being obedient to the invitation that God gives us, that God has given me. And if you take anything from today, as we talk about seize the day, we're going to continue on that. Know that most of the time when you're about to seize the day or seize the moment, it comes from an invitation that God is calling on your heart, and I'm telling you to not ignore it. Listen to it. Step forward. And I only stand here because of that invitation. So let's dive in and look at that. So carpe diem is what? Latin for seize the day, right? Carpe diem. But I love, I love the explanation of this. Because when we think seize the day, I, I just need to seize right now. But sometimes that day can, can stretch a little bit in two or three, or it, it can be within just a few moments or a few seconds even. And some of that perspective that God gives. As, as I was thinking about walking into this building and seeing my journey... And, and, and my wife's and, and, you know, this family, all in like one swoop. You know, we all have those songs or moments that, that automatically take us to memories or, 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 or you know, events or, or times in our lives that just change us or make us just, there's a depth there that you just can't explain. And, you know, I'll, I'll admit I'm walking in here and we came early so we could get set up and it's like, man, this is so weird so weird but it's good weird because of where god has moved us and and so with this and thinking about carpe diem seize the day the term or the thing that they or the the phrase that they use it's used to urge someone to make the most of the present time and give little thought to the future the present time not just today, not just this moment, but the present time, living in that fullness that God calls us to live into. So eight weeks now into this series, as I've talked and shared with uh, Pastor Dave, and, and this question, you know, when, when he raised the, the series title and he said, seize the day, I had to ask myself, have I seized the day myself? And today, I, I'm here to encourage or to ask the same, have you seized the day? Have you taken the most of what has been offered, the good, the bad, the in-between, and everything else that is encompassed in this life, and have you seized what God has given you? Well, I, it's so funny. Um, this is really going to date me. This this uh, the saying came to my mind, which was from a popular soap opera. Like this, like the sands through the hourglass is what? So are the days of our lives. Boy, that just made me really old. But the great thing about the days of our lives, you can miss it for a few years and you're still caught right back up, right? <laughs> my mom would be proud because she's in. She loves that soap opera and still does. But truly, so are the days of our lives where are those sands that go through that hourglass. And I'm just thinking of how quickly that hourglass goes or that sand goes through that hourglass. Because I remember in 2003, I was standing up here for the first time by an invitation from Pastor Jim Pagan to share on some of the life-changing moments and, and, and things that have happened in my life as I had come to Christ and accepted his call to follow him as a new believer. I knew who Christ was all my life. My grandparents, my mom, my grandma, my, my great aunt, they were great at, at helping us to see, but we never, there, that one piece that was missing in my life was knowing that I had to choose to follow Christ. And Christ is always there. The misconception is, I've accepted Christ in my life. No, he's walked with us. We just haven't seen him yet. And the, the passage of scripture that I, that I read that day, it, it is so clear as I was thinking about this perspective of, and, and even being recharged a little bit. It came from John chapter 8, 
And anybody, if, if you have your Bibles, I have a few key verses, so I try not to jump too much. But John chapter 8, it started with verse 12. And, and it says, you know, in, in the subheading, I am the light of the world. And again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then I went on to, to read this, this specific passage a couple times. When Jesus was talking to the Jews, it's in verse 31 through 36. And it's, the truth will set you free. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains in the house forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. Immediately to my heart came the song Amazing Grace. And just at this time, when that, that song was sung and played in, in November you know, 2003, I was once blind, but now I see. Was. Now to see the love of Jesus Christ, the love to see and the ability to see a whole new perspective of the world. But that to be set free comes by an invitation. Verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. He, he invites, and we know through his disciples, he invited them to what? Follow him. Leave everything and follow him. The disciples seized the day. They seized the moment and forever changed the history of this world by following Christ, taking in his teachings, getting some rebuke at times, getting knocked down, beat up, martyred in the end, but still changed the world because we all sit here because of the word that they continued to share after Christ left this world, right? We're all products of that. That's some of the freeness and, and the, the openness that God shares with us. And so to be that scared, I was a few pounds heavier. My hair was much darker. Kid, I had no clue still, though, what this was going to look like. None of us do, right? We don't know. And that's the, the, the piece that we're here to share because there are, is no coincidences and no unplanned opportunities that God doesn't know about. He knows about everything, right? So when we're asked to, to, to seize the day, it's not just seizing the day, it's taking a portion of what we have in that moment that's going to add to what? Our journey. Because we already know, as it was the, the scripture was read, and we'll unpack it again a little bit, the mystery of that to know that there's two outcomes in this life period for all of us we know that it's either with god or without god that's the end result period but it's what we do in the in between that matters the most and so when i i asked pastor dave uh, about these uh, this sermon series you know, what do you think? And, and what have you been preaching on? And, and what are the scriptures? He sent them all to me. And I know I, we could easily break each one down again, but to take the perspective of what has been shared over the last eight weeks, it, it's unique to see because it's almost an oath or a mission statement. So you may want to go back and revisit this, or I can share it with you later, but it, it, it's so unique. So uh, I will, with joyful, 
with a joyful heart always, choose this day whom I will serve. To encourage, other, to encourage others knowing that my daily provision is covered. I will pick up my cross daily, being dressed for battle, always ready to give account for what God has done for me in my life because there's work to be done. I felt like Pastor Dave was reading my biography when you read that over. So I choose jo joyfully always, choose this day to encourage one another, knowing that my provision is taken care of, to pick up my cross daily, always being dressed for battle, always ready to share because there's work to be done. Pretty neat to see eight weeks come together in 30 seconds worth of a message. But yet the power and impact that that has for each one of you, like I said right from the beginning, I would not be here if it wasn't to answer those invitations. And I know it's easy as, as, as some of us, uh, you know, sometimes we can get comfortable, uh, you know, carp, going back to that, that definition of carpe diem, you know, it's the pastor's job to urge us, right? I have no, no skin in the game here. I have no other reason to share or urge you but then that of a brother in Christ that I remember sitting where you guys are sitting and being in the ups and downs. Have I always been joyful? No. Have I always chosen the right way to go to choose this day of whom I would serve? No. Have I encouraged others at times? Have I disappointed others? Absolutely. We can all put ourselves in this, right? Have we worried about uh, some of the, the provisions that God's going to provide? At times. Is it easy to pick up our cross daily or to be dressed for battle or always ready to share? No. But when we do, our lives are changed. So I'm here today to encourage each one of you to continue to walk and seize the day, but to be willing to step out of your comfort zone when God's calling you to step out of that comfort zone. A good brother of mine who's not here this morning used the saying that I've now coined and always use is, to, is that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And I actually know um, from a message that I got to share last week, um, the actual author of that, now I already forgot his name, but regardless, to step out of the end of your comfort zone means that you're going to have to step out onto some shaky ground, but know when you do that the fruit is going to be so powerful and so great that life is going to change around you. And it's, God's not asking everybody to become directors of a city mission, but he is asking you to just fill your part and role, whether it's in your family or at your work or, or with a neighbor or within this body of believers, within this community, within Chautauqua County, across seas in Uganda or Cuba or wherever that may be, as long as you're answering that invitation, your life will be changed forever. And it's, it's, it's amazing as, as I, I get the chance to look back. Ten years ago, ten years ago in November, it's actually, it was November 10th, 2011, at 8 o'clock in the morning. God had been working on my heart, and, and at that time I was a co-lay leader with Barb here in this church to, to step forward. And, and a sister in Christ had to look at my number um, at the time, I still, I had a flip phone. I have, uh, for those who know me, it took a long, long time to have to upgrade to the smartphone. My wife will tell you. Uh, I loved my flip phone, still do. Uh, but it wasn't the end-all, be-all. But it was amazing how God uses people to reach out to you with invitations. So don't take that lightly as well. So she reached out to me, had to find my number, and then she sent me this message, and, and I wrote down the, the main portion of it because the, the pretext for it was, hey, please don't think I'm crazy because God has a message for you today, and I don't want you to think that this is all weird or anything, but I had to share it. And so she was hearing God 
to use her gift of prophetic word to say, hey, you need to tell this person. So the actual message was, your calling to teach and encourage my believers is very important. Do not take it lightly. Know that my spirit is with you and I will guide you and know that my love for you is endless. It took me 10 years to discover truly what that calling is. 10 years. To teach and encourage. The biggest portion of that is is for me to help others to see there is work to be done yet as we work on ourselves. Am I perfect by any means? Oh, no. No way. But there's work to be done as we look at being joyful always, to choose this day, to encourage one another, to know that, our, that we will be provided for, that picking up our cross is the right thing to do, to be dressed for battle, always ready, because there's work to be done. And I share this knowing that I'm no different than anybody else. Like I said, I, I, there's no gain for me to share this, but only for the kingdom of God. And, and just to give you a, a quick perspective of, of what that looks like in my life, and, and you could put yourself in whatever, whatever that looks like for you. Where was I when I felt this call? Or where was I? Or what did I hear? Or what did I do? So some of the, some of the invitations that I received... I, I felt this nudge to ask the pastor's daughter in 1995 to introduce me to this curly-haired girl who was completely from another school, whom then would become my wife. Totally out of my comfort zone. Never did that. Plus, it was basketball season. At that time, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want any de- to deal with any girls, but I went at some place that I wasn't supposed to be at, technically, We weren't going to go. We weren't dressed for it. And yet, God used all that to introduce me to my wife. To accept the, uh, we were just talking about this today, to accept the invitation to attend a small group. And then to church. Mind you, this small group was in a trailer where we were sitting on uh, one of their van seats because instead of, you know, needing more room, we brought the van seat into the house, or they did, and those crazy people let uh, chickens and ducks, baby ducks run around their house, and then they introduced us to this weird guy that has a beard, um, but yet changed my life, impacted my life we, by an invitation to seize the day. We could have said no. My wife and I were struggling at the time. We could have said no, but God used that invitation. Accepted the invitation to attend a retreat weekend. Most of you, or some of you might know it as Koinonia. Changed my life forever. I could speak all day on that. Accepted the opportunity to meet a young man, a young boy, whom I've never met, to come into my home. By the invitation of a of a a sister in Christ who I attend licensing school with, who goes to a completely other church and says, hey, you got to come meet this little boy. And most of you who know me now, he's not little. He's actually stronger than his dad, but I don't let him know that. <clears throat> Accept the invitation to join a prison ministry. Without going to this prison ministry, and I have brothers in Christ who have been there and been part of that, and it's nothing special it, that... God doesn't want us to do, but that prison ministry opened the door for me to become and and to lead this ministry that I'm a part of now. It's called Curex. So the, to accept the call to be a past, to go to pastoral licensing school, which this church body ordained and sent me, so I can know and understand and experience what God wanted me to see, but knew and found out, you know, was once blind, but now I see, or to know the truth. God just needed me to see that this is good but I need you to be part of this. And another prophetic word came. He said, I need you to be a pillar of this community. I don't want to be a pillar. A pillar is something that holds a lot of weight. 
a lot of weight. And if it's shaken, what happens? The building falls. But I don't hold it on my own strength. To accept a call to care for a three-day-old three little boy. Seize the day. We had, we had an hour and a half to seize that moment. Hour and a half. My wife calls me. She's at work. Hey, the county called. We ha- they have a little boy that needs a home. He's now our son. And his life's been changed forever. We've tried to see and know and understand where his, his biological mom might be, and he knows and understands that he is. Uh, he has, he's super special because he has two moms and dads. He's not a victim. He's a victor. And so all that, through that journey, accept the invitation to work at the UCAN City Mission, first as a program director and now as the executive director. Mind you, I am, a, I am truly, for those who know me, I am truly a country boy at heart. I still have my toy tractors that I grew up with. I kid you not. And I have collected more, and I know it drives my family crazy, but I love everything about farming. I do the smell, the dirt, the grime, the animals, the heartache. And yet here I am, country boy by heart. I said I've never worked in the city. I never work at a desk. And I couldn't be more in the middle of the city than where I am working right now on 7 West 1st Street in the middle of Jamestown and at the, behind a desk, which has now added to the few extra pounds I now carry because my activity has changed. Granted. But through uh, diligent work and and continued obedience, we are moving forward with, you know, building our house, so that's helping keep some of that off. But each time, there was work required with those moments that God called us to do this or to do that, to take this little boy in, to, to go to this prison, to, you know, to be an executive director. I have no formal training. I have life training. There's no reason why I should be at that desk, but yet God has given me the opportunity. And if you've read the papers, you know that we're going through a time and a trial and some battles to present and expand the ministry through not only a a pandemic, but also that of of what God has next. And so, like Barb said, please pray for that. So, but remember, it's, it's this scripture here that I want to encourage us with that we looked at and, and was shared by Cindy and Amy. It's 1 Corinthians, there, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. So Pastor Dave shared last week as he concluded his message about the inheritance, always being ready to give an account of why I am a Christian, right? Why are you a Christian? You know, it's easy for us to explain or to share... Um, you know, what do I do at work? Or, you know, what do I, why do I play basketball? Or why do I do this? But, you know, he, he emphasized at the end portion of the message of why it's important to share and, and why we do it. And because of that inheritance of, of eternal life that we don't want others to miss out on. So I won't read the whole passage again in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 15, But it's the last part that I want us to look at. Verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, knowing that in the Lord the labor is not in vain. As you work to seize the day, to work on being joyful. It doesn't say being happy always, right? Happy is an emotion. That can come and go. Anger can come and go, but joyful. Regardless of what I endure or experience, it's not pleasant having to battle against the city as a director. I never expected that. Or to have somebody from the community say, hey, you're creating a hostile environment because you, your standards say this for employment, and yet you're coming against the LGBTQ or this other piece here, and it's like, no, that's not true. To have a young man come to you and question your beliefs, you say you're a Christian, but you're asking me to leave. Tell me why you're a Christian and why are you asking me to leave? That's hard. But 
God gives us the answers, and he, he lets us know, and he fills us with his power, his spirit, and, and gives us that opportunity that for that young man, hey, we're holding the standard. Very simple. And the standard doesn't drop. The bar doesn't drop. That's it for everybody across. This gentleman simply was not doing his chore. And we gave him four opportunities to just do his chore and clean his bed. How many of us have to clean our own beds and do our chores at home? It was no different, but yet he was taking this as an opportunity because he's hurt and didn't want that accountability that said, well, you say you're a Christian, why are you kicking me out? It's like, no, you made the choice as we all get that choice, that invitation to follow Christ. He had the invitation and choice to just do his chore and he would have a home and have a place. Is that easy for me to say, no, you can't stay? Oh, no, every part of my being because I want this person to succeed, you know, if I drop that a little bit, oh, it's okay, I would feel good at the moment, but knowing in the end, the long term, that person would not be better than who he is now. But it's not all heartache. Because as, as Pastor Dave had shared, with being ready for the work to be done, knowing, so abounding always in the work of the Lord, knowing that, the Lord, uh, that in the Lord you labor not in vain, I would have not have been prepared for a young woman, a mother, struggling from mental health, substance abuse, mother of four children who are in the foster care system, just got out of the hospital that day, comes into the, to the mission, which we are all male shelter at this time, and says, I need to be baptized. What do you do with that? You baptize them. You do. Yes, I, I, I know and have experienced what it is to, to be in the pastoral role, but we're all called to what? As disciples, as, and we'll unpack that in a moment here, as disciples to do what? Go into the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them what Jesus ta- taught them how to do, right? Matthew 28, 19 through 20. This young woman came in and she just knew. She went to a couple churches that weren't available. They weren't closed. Because usually during the week, sometimes the churches are open, sometimes they're not, right? It, realistically, the pastor isn't always there. Don't expect him to always be here. We want him to be out learning and, and teaching and growing and sharing and doing some of his own ministry, right? Not just here of the church. So she came to them and she said, like, I've never, I've never walked down the street. I, I can drive. I've never come here. I've never thought that. But she knew Jesus Christ had changed her life and said, I need to be baptized. And so after asking several questions, because we're what also called to discern, is this person really meaning she needs to be baptized or is there something else there? But she, after revealing that story and her, the truth, she knew that and I knew that she needed to be baptized and how special and powerful that was and to bring the staff on and to see her just in absolute tears and to see the water flowing over her head. We don't have a submersion tank, but I did my best to just drown her as much as I could with as much water as I could so she could experience the outside washing that she has received on the inside, right? But that comes by an invitation, We're all called to care for the PPOWs, the poor, the prison, the orphan, the widows, and the sick. And as as some of you know, I'm a a huge movie buff. And so I've taken this uh, phrase from from the movie, the original movie of Transformers. It says, says, fate rarely calls upon us at a moment of our choosing. I know it drives my wife crazy, but... It's not fate that rarely calls upon us at a moment of our choosing. It's God rarely calls upon us at a moment of our choosing. So when he's inviting us to seize the day with that work to be done, press into it. But know this, and I can't leave you with all this hope and encouragement because I remember when Barb and I stood here were ordained and, and, and or commissioned as lay leaders. Uh, Pastor Roy Miller was here. After the service was here, he said, know this, because you have now stood in the gap and you stand for God in this leadership role, and we're all leaders, by the way. Don't, don't discredit that. We're all leaders. But know this, he says, 
When you take that stand and that step, alarms in hell are going to be going off and another entity that's bigger, nastier, and stronger is going to be coming after you in many ways. We see it all the time. As the director of the city mission, I've seen demon-possessed men come through who needed some salvation, which is real. I know it sounds crazy, but it's real. That they were just digging and, and, and you can't explain it unless you see and I got God bumps, not goosebumps, God bumps, because it's the truth. To know when you accept and seize this day, that's going to happen. It's not always going to be hard. It's not going to always be easy. Sometimes we're going to have to journey through the desert alone. Jesus did, but he wasn't alone. We know this because God was always with him, right? If you're going through the desert, know that. God will never leave you nor forsake you. Sometimes he takes you to new locations. Like I shared, this is our home church, always will be. And we had some moments in our life where we were walking through the desert and we thought, okay, maybe we'll come back and plug in here. And God's like, uh, 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 no, 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 no. Old, old wineskin versus new wineskin. Old shoe, old sneaker versus new shoe. The old skin is not going to work. The old shoe is not going to fit. As much as we wanted to plug in and get to back to what is new and good and, and comfortable for us, he says no. So, Know that we continue to pray for all of you and are grateful for the journeys that we have walked alongside of you and still walk, walk alongside of you. But know that sometimes you have to go to a new location, which then opened the door for us to be building a new home and we're grateful for. And as soon as we get a few more things wrapped up, everyone is welcome to come. Because it's not just our home, it's something that God has planned for others to be used. People will question you. Hardest thing ever is to have somebody ever question your faith. I've had it done several times to me now, and, and it does, you know, some of them will throw a convincing argument out there, but know that God says when you have at least the faith of the mustard seed that you can remain strong. But all that takes work by trusting in Him. We have work to do as we seize that day always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord your God, through in the Lord your God, labor is not in vain. And know that your struggles can be a blessing to others. We, we grow from those struggles. There's so many pieces that people have seen of our lives. Facebook's a nice one. Facebook, you can see a lot of positive things if, if you post a lot of positive things or you can post a lot of negative things. But a lot of times, for myself, when I post something, I may have struggled through things, but know that it's a blessing that I needed to share with others. I know a lot of you have followed the process of us building this house. We built one once already, and I know a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of Where's Archie? A lot of his blood is into that house right now because he smashed his hand first, first and foremost from our original home. But now we've moved into a, we're moving forward with a second home. But even though the struggles have been there, people, wow, look at your home. Well, you get to see the end result, but know this, it, it was not easy, right? And I use that analogy because when you step forward to start building or working in the ministry or doing what you need to do, that God calls you to do, there will be struggles, there will be trials, but God will help and see you through. So as I conclude and wrap up here, I have one final scripture for you. It comes from Luke chapter 9, verse 62. The cost of following Jesus. He shares in, in, in the first part here about having not, no place to you know, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. He's, another person came, hey, this person passed away, and he said, let the dead bury the dead. He just, he's calling upon our hearts here, but this final piece, 
Verse 62, Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's fit. Some, some translations say fit for the service of the kingdom of God. New International, American Standard, and uh, I think New Living Translation all say fit for the service of the kingdom of God. It doesn't say that you can't not be with me in heaven. But if anybody knows, with the olden days, if you're holding onto a plow and you look back, what's going to happen? Well, better yet, if you're driving along in your car, how many people do this? You're driving along in your car and you see something alongside of the road and you turn your head, what happens? Your car follows where you're usually looking, right? God wants us to be on that straight and narrow path when we're putting the furrows and we're putting in the work. God says when you're accepting the call of Jesus Christ, there's work to be done, but don't veer off and don't look and get distracted about trying to look back. I can't come back to where I was in 2003. Too much has happened now. But I can move forward, and, and like I said, each one of you are a person. Uh, each one of you, even now today, for those who don't know me and who don't know my wife and don't know our journey, you're still a part of it. And one day when we're all worshiping at the feet of Jesus Christ, how much cooler will it be to share those stories and, oh, I never knew this was that or this happened, or, but yet, look, here we all are. But when you accept the call, know there's work to be done, the work that we just need to do is just do the next right thing. That's work. Just do the next right thing. Seize this day. Join me in prayer if you would, please. <sighs> Father God, there are so many journeys here in this place that are represented Some of these journeys, Father, I know that I've seen firsthand and walked side by side with joy, with laughter, with tears, with hurt, with struggle, with healing, with woundedness, and yet, Father, you have given us the opportunity to walk it. And today, Father, you call us to seize this day, to know, to be joyful always, Father, and to, to move forward and to be ready. Father, I pray for my family here. That stepping out of these doors, they're able to seize whatever comes forth, good, bad, or indifferent, to know that the work that you have set forth, you will not leave us nor forsake us, and that we can move forward confidently. I am so grateful for you, Father. I'm so grateful for this family. I pray a hedge of protection over each one here physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And for those who, uh, who have maybe at home or who weren't able to be here, I pray the same as well. And as I prayed this morning, Father, I'm grateful and thankful. And I pray for those who have been here before us, those who are with us now, and those as this ministry continues who are yet to come because of your, accept, your invitation and our acceptance of Seize the Day. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So as, as Sister Barb said, seize the day. May the Lord be your vision always, regardless of where you may be or what you may encounter. Know that the enemy isn't happy with the work that's being done, but he has no foothold or no toehold over what God can do and has you protected. Go in that strength each and every day through the salvation and blood of Jesus Christ with the help of the helper that he promised and has sent that of the Holy Spirit each and every day. Go in peace and be blessed. Amen.